I got to tell you the story. I got a 10-year-old daughter. When I come home every day at dinner, 6, 6.30, she goes, she calls me Nessie. She goes, Nessie, tell me, how many lives did you save today? How many lives did you change? Tell me out of all the cases, like if I'm the doctor, you know. <laughs> Beyond Clean offers a creative look into the inner workings of a healthcare industry committed to getting it right every instrument, every time. Join us every week as we explore the hidden world of one of the most important aspects of safe surgical care. And now your hosts, Michael Matthews, Hank Balch, and Justin Poulin. This week on Beyond Clean, we speak with Nestor Hernandez, Sterile Processing Department Manager at Lehigh Valley Health Network. Nestor speaks at regional ISHM seminars, has developed a pre-certification course, and prompts others to be successful, sensible, and empowers them to do their job to the highest degree of quality possible. Nestor is industrious, efficient, and organized with a scrupulous attention to detail. Nestor also is our guest on our 26th episode of Beyond Clean. So that's six months in the books, guys. And 26 episodes went by very quickly. But I'm proud to say that we've been putting these out on a weekly basis since the beginning of September. And I've really enjoyed our time with all of the guests that have supported the show through our first six months. Yeah, and I was only here for you know a few of them. But I'm really looking forward to being a part of as many as y'all will leave me on here for. But I got to tell you, Justin, I have been listening to you talk up Nestor for a while, and I'm really excited about this. You know, if for no other reason than just the fact that Nestor has a reputation for empowering those frontline technicians, which is a huge passion of mine. And so I'm really looking forward to listening to how he does that. Nestor is one of the names that keeps coming up again and again in the industry and our tagline is we talk to the biggest names in the industry we tackle the biggest challenges and obviously if his name is coming up and we need to talk to him but one of the biggest challenges that everyone agrees with is there are so few sterile processing leaders speaking which is the reason that we created this podcast to give a platform for speaking and sharing these stories. I'm excited to hear how Nestor has been doing that and also, like Mike said, how he's encouraging others to find their voice. You know, last week we spoke with Ralph Basile, and it didn't make the podcast because we were talking after the interview, but Ralph made that exact point. He said, we really need more voices coming forward in this industry. So it was serendipitous that we had already booked Nestor for this interview to follow his. And I have known Nestor for quite a while. I've seen him speak at these regional Isham seminars. He does an amazing job, and I know that the listeners and the listening audience is going to enjoy this podcast very much today. So stay tuned and buckle up. It's going to be a good one. You can follow Beyond Clean on Twitter at Beyond Clean Info. The Facebook page is facebook.com slash beyond clean podcast. And then LinkedIn, linkedin.com slash company slash beyond clean. Our Instagram page, Beyond Clean Podcast. There's lots of pictures there that you can go check out. They've all been submitted anonymously from our listening audience. They've done a really nice job of raising attention on that Instagram for really detailed inspection points that everybody should be paying attention to. If you want to submit one of those pictures anonymously or if you have a recommendation for a future guest or topic, simply send us an email to info at beyondclean.net. We'll be right back with Nestor Hernandez. Joining us now is Nestor Hernandez, Sterile Processing Department Manager at Lehigh Valley Health Network. And Nestor, I know you and I know each other pretty well. We actually spoke just this past Saturday at a regional seminar, and I know it was a special event for you for many reasons that we'll get into during the interview, but also... One of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is because I just think so many more people, and and Hank and Mike are also another example of this, but many more people that work in sterile processing need to continue to find their voice and go out and, and speak on behalf of the profession that is sterile processing. So I just want to thank you for coming on to the show today. 
Thank you, Justin, for having me and being part of the show. Greatly appreciate it. Why don't we start with introducing you to the listening audience and talk about your career background. Tell us about your story or your path to sterile processing. Okay. I work at Lehigh Valley Hospital currently for the last six years. I have a total of 37 plus years experience as a sterile processing manager. Little did I thought that I would be where I'm at today when I was 18 years old. So that's a long, long, long time ago. Part of my story, it's a long story, but I try to keep it as short as possible um, for those that are listening. At 18, you know, you're at that age where you're wondering, what am I going to do? What is my house, my life going to unfold? You know, lived in New York City, the middle child. My mom was mom and dad at the same time. And, you know, we had a lot of challenges. We lived in a project, you know, in, in, in New York. We weren't rich, but we had each other. We were really, really happy. But I, I got to tell you this. I had very good grades in school, and I was, I was an introvert. And I was one of those kids that was by myself, didn't want to talk to anyone. And today, you know, even my wife tells me, I can't get you to shut up because I, I don't stay quiet. I talk. And I think I'm just making up for all the years that I was so silent and quiet. But I was because I was tapping into myself and trying to discover who am I? What is my story? Where am I going to head? Who am I going to be? Didn't want to be like my dad. And that's a total different story. But I remember one day I was coming home from high school and I came home and I walked in and there was my mom, you know, Spanish speaking lady, didn't know too much English. And there was these two guys uh, all dressed up suits, looking really sharp. And, you know, they were talking to my mom and I walked in and I, I thought I was in trouble. I thought, oh my God, you know, they're here to arrest me. What did I do wrong? And I started questioning myself, you know, what was it a candy bar that I, took and I didn't pay and so on and so on. And here, these guys, these guys were there to give me an offer to go. Are you ready for this, Justin? To go to MIT, Massachusetts what? Institute of Technology. Okay. And if you know anything about what I'm sure you know, it's like, because I wanted to be a, a, an, an engineer. I wanted to be an architect. And, and I have pretty good grades. But the opportunity was good, and maybe I didn't know too much of the school. And they left, and Mom was like, you know, think about it, my son. Let me know in the morning. So morning I got up, and I went to Mom, and my mom was a retired registered nurse. I said, Mom, when I grow up, I just want to be like you. I want to be like you. So that touched my mom's heart. And she's like, oh, my son wants to be like me. Well, Long story short, at the same time, I was planning a wedding at 18, got married, New York City, went to Fort Myers, Florida at 18 years old, talking about following your passion or trying to figure out where you fit. And here, you know, we got a humble apartment and now I needed to look for a job. The closest hospital was 15 miles away. Don't have a driver's license don't have a vehicle. So I went to the Salvation Army, got me a bicycle, got on the bike. I remember that Monday morning, 15 miles, I was fitted, man, to take that ride. Don't ask me to get on a bike now. Story is a totally little different, you know? And I remember making it into human resources office. I walked in and there she was. Not going to mention her name, right? But there she was. And she looked at me, and it's how this lady looked at me from head to toe, that she was telling me something like I did not belong there. But I was there because I just wanted to apply for the warehouse position at this hospital. So she looked at me, and she did some actions with her hands, and her actions was like brushing me away, telling me, you don't belong here. And it's what she says. She said, we don't have a job for you. So discouragement settled in. Disappointment settled in. The passion was gone. Started questioning myself. What am I doing here? Why did I come here? And I know that many of us go through situations like this, you know, in life where we're questioning, am I in the right job? Am I in the right hospital? Am I in the right position? Maybe I should just go back to be a tech one and not be a manager, can't deal with this anymore. 
for man, it was that passion, that instinct in me that was telling me the next day, go back. So I went back. But when I went back, I didn't go to HR. I went to the main lobby. And I remember walking around the main lobby, didn't know what I was doing, but something was telling me it's here. And I started looking, and there was the directory. Fourth floor, it had the name of the vice president of human resources. And I was like, I got to go talk to this guy. So I went up to the fourth floor, walked around the hallway, saw his name on a plate. I kind of glanced in, secretary is sitting there. I went up and down, pacing the hallways, trying to figure out, what are you doing, Nestor? Where are we going with this? I walked in. As I walked in, she asked the question, how may I help you? And I go, my name is Nestor Hernandez. I'm here to see Mr. So-and-so. And as I'm having this conversation with her, the architect in me is designing the room. You know, I see a door to my right that leads to another office, and I'm kind of tuning my right ear to see if I hear any sound and no sound. So I didn't even know if this VP was even in his office. So I calculated my distance from where I was standing to the door. It was seven and a half steps. And I'm like, I got to take these steps. I'll never know if he's there or not. So I did. When I walked into my surprise, the VP was in his office. And this is all I said, Mr. So-and-so, I am here because I felt discriminated against the color of my skin. This guy got up, went into the computer, and he called me son. He goes, what are you talking about, son? He went into the computer again, and then he says, come with me, son. Man, you know, if you know my story about growing up not having a father, and here's this total stranger calling me a son, I knew that I had this job. He walked with me to human resource. When that lady saw me in human resource with her boss, she knew that he meant business. Make a long story short, three days later, I started working in the warehouse. And I remember one day I was asked to deliver products to a department called the sterile processing department. And it was that day when I walked into that department and I saw all those people dressed in blue. I called them and I still do the Smurfs. And I'm like, what is going on here? And it was like buying a car for the first time or buying a house. That feeling like, this is it. This is where my life is going to start. This is where my passion is going to begin. And I saw myself at the right place at the right time. And for the next 17 years, I was managing that department. It was amazing. And I could go on with that story, but it was amazing. And I remember the day that I put my resignation to come to Pennsylvania because my mom was sick. And I remember the VP coming down and saying, Nestor, I'll never forget that day that you came in my office. Talk about passion and how passion is born. It's born out of that instant, that feeling in you when you know you're in the right position, you're saying you're doing the right things at the right time. And that's pretty much in a couple of minutes or seconds, my <laughs> background and my no, story. That's right. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful story there, Nestor. And a theme that has come up a number of times actually in our interviews with folks has been the impact and the power of mentorship. And I know the VP of Human Resources, you know, it came up a couple of times in your story, obviously, as the one who opened the door for you. And then I'm assuming, you know, stayed in your life throughout your time, at least at that hospital. Has there been anyone else in the sterile processing world or department that has really impacted you in your leadership and in your ability to find your why? Oh, yeah. So in the same hospital, I actually started as a technician in the department. And um, I remember a lot of my friends telling me, you're not going to work for that lady, her name. And I'm going to mention her, la- her name, Mary Kirkwood. So Mary Kirkwood was the department manager. And she was tough. Man, you talk about following the Amy standards to the T. This lady was like, on top of it. So everyone who worked with her before felt, man, to work with that lady is going to be tough. But she saw in me, I guess, what I felt, and she took me under her wings. 
and she prepared me. And then she moved on to uh, work as an infection control nurse. And then the opportunity opened, and I stepped into that role. And I always go back to that story because I believe that if it not had been for this lady and what she saw in me, maybe I will be doing something different right now. So, Nestor, I can tell that, you know, you're really, really uh, passionate about, you know, being empowered and empowering others. I'm guessing here that you have invested a lot of your effort and your management style towards empowering your, uh, you know, technicians. Correct. Mm -hmm. So kind of tell us a little bit about how you go about empowering your technicians to be their best or get certified or whatever it is it takes to move them along to the next level in their career? I think you said the key word, get certified. Um, and, and one of the things that I always tell my, my technician even today is, you know, when you go to take your, your pet to the pet groomers or when you go get a haircut, you know, those individuals, they need a license to do what they do. You know, you just don't bring your fluffy or whatever you call your dog to a pet groomer and trust that they know what they're doing. They must be certified through the state. So why not, you know, raise the bar, raise the bar and become certified. So at the current hospital that I'm working at now, Lehigh Valley Hospital, I remember I started there as an educator and I was an educator. I remember when I started in November, my biggest challenge was, I remember my boss bringing me into the office and saying, Nestor, we got a problem. We have 16 employees that were told 12 months ago that within 18 months, if they're not certified, they're all going to be fired. Can you help us certify these folks? What do I do? So we got the Isham curriculum. We got all of the information, got myself a classroom. I actually went and challenged the Isham test myself because I felt if I'm going to be teaching this course, because I was CBSPD, I'm going to go, I want to pass this. So I did, and I passed it. So we took the 16 employees, well, it was actually 15, because one refused to even be part of it. He felt come March of the next year, they're not going to fire me. Well, March came and he lost his job. But the success of this story is that out of the 16 people, 14 passed. 14 technicians passed. One did not pass, a Spanish-speaking gentleman. And I felt so bad for him to the point that I would go to his house some days during the week and try to translate or interpret you know, from English to Spanish to try to help him. But I kept telling him the test is in Spanish. It's, not, it's in English. It's not in Spanish. But he did try. He felt that we hired him under a different position. But we try to empower and uh, help those that don't believe within themselves that I'm good enough to be certified, oh, what's the purpose behind being certified? So that, that's a really good story. Until today, those folks are still working in the department. Some have moved on to surgical technologist positions and so on and so on. You just talked about purpose, and I think that ties in perfectly with maybe giving our audience an overview of your most recent public speaking topic. You developed a program called mm -hmm. Discovering Your Why, and I thought maybe we could take five minutes and just give everybody an overview. I know the people that are in our region have had a chance to see you present on this topic a couple of times, but you know, you do such a, well, I'll just say it. You've closed out almost every regional show in the last couple of years because you're so inspiring. So maybe talk a little bit about this Thank newest you. topic. You. you know, it's funny because when they call me, they go, uh, we need a closer. So <laughs> it's like, you're the closer. All right. So look, I'm not going to talk to you about sterilization. I can, and I have some topics of, you know, building a case of quality, the passion that empowers. But the, the latest one has really touched my soul. And it all had to do 
with a movie that I was watching, Collateral Beauty, Will Smith, in the movie, at the beginning of the movie, he says, the whys of our lives, why did we wake up this morning? He, he was addressing um, his staff. Why do we eat the things that we eat? Why do we do the things that we do? And the answer was we do it because we want to connect. As a sterile processing technician, why do we do the things that we do? We don't want to lose that purpose, that why, that passion, because that's why why is. Why is your purpose? Who do you want to connect with? You want to connect with your patients. Even though we technicians do not have direct patient contact, but we must understand that what we do impacts the care of that patient. And for that, you need purpose. For that, you must believe within yourself. It it starts at home. You know, I'm the type of person that in order for me to be successful in motivating others, got to start with me motivating me, myself, me finding my why. Because when I find my why, then my why would help me restore my purpose. Because we get so caught up in everything that we do, the numbers and graphs and this and that. Sometimes I feel that I'm a fireman or a, a, a counselor. I am all of that at work. And sometimes we forget what our purpose really is. So when you know your why, knowing gives you a filter to make choices at work or even at home. Knowing will help you find greater fulfillment fulfillment in what you do every single day, that on your way to work, you know your purpose. I'm going to save lives. I got to tell you the story. I got a 10-year-old daughter. When I come home every day at dinner, 6, 6.30, she goes, she calls me Nessie. She goes, Nessie, tell me, how many lives did you save today? How many lives did you change? Tell me out of all the cases, like if I'm the doctor, you know, (laughs) but she understands what I do because she's even gone with me when I teach the certification course. So she knows what I do. But in her mind, the mind of a 10-year-old, she gets it. She understands that my purpose is to save lives. So that's, that's, that's one of the greatest topics that I've been able to share with my audience. And, you know, the most impacting thing about this topic is when you see the tears in people's eyes in the audience and you're like, what is going on here? And then at the end, people coming up to you and saying, you know, you said this and it touched me because I went through that situation. You, you, you hit it out of the park. So that, it's pretty awesome to be able to have you know, the opportunity to share that purpose because that purpose empowers other people. That's fantastic. It's really no wonder why you're the closer uh, just listening to you talk. And I've seen you speak, but um, Hank and Mike and I talk in the background on a chat while we do the interview to make sure we're coordinated. And I know Hank and Mike are also uh, really impressed with the interview, Nestor. So I'm looking forward to segment two. We are going to talk about your specific why and also some of the reasons that people get into public speaking and maybe ways that anyone out there that has thought about doing public speaking can be encouraged to do so. So we'll be right back with Nestor Hernandez. All right, we're back with Nestor Hernandez, Sterile Processing Department Manager at Lehigh Valley Health Network. And I think now we're going to focus on trying to empower others to find their voice. I know we talked about helping others achieve certification and achieve their potential, but this industry just needs more voices speaking up to uh, raise the perception of professionalism. I think we all know that this is a profession that requires a lot of knowledge and attention to detail, but we need to market that out in the industry. And so let's start with maybe inspiring individuals to go down this road and take this path. And starting with you, Nestor, tell us why you decided to begin speaking at events specifically on sterile processing topics. 
it was funny because as an introvert, you know, to stand in front of an audience and talk to people, it's like, oh, my God. But what was funny was that people were coming to me and saying, you have a voice. You know, sometimes you don't believe that you are that person that people believe that you are. And going back to that why, you know, you get lost and you don't understand, you know, what's my purpose? I was surrounded by a lot of great people in the industry, you know, from one hospital to the other that I worked. And these individuals empowered me and said, Nestor, you have a voice. And the last person, she was my administrator, Dorothy Jones at Lehigh Valley Hospital. She's now in California. And I remember she called me in the office and she goes, Nestor, what are you doing? Master, you need to you need to talk. You need to get out there. You need to get out there and share what you know. So I started writing topics on topics that spoke to me. And I think that it's so important. You know, speak about something that speaks to you first and that you can tie a story to it. For me, it's paying it forward. For me, it's telling the Mary Kirkwoods, thank you for taking me under your wing. For me, it's the Dorothy Jones that took me under their wings. And, and today, even my boss right now, Hope Johnson, an amazing, she's Dr. Johnson, you know, in her 30s. But she has believed in me and has given me the opportunity to just at the time and share the knowledge. So when I speak, I speak from my heart. I speak from true experiences and I try to tie it up with what I already know and what I feel that people need to hear. We all have a story. So you, the audience that's listening, you do have a story to tell. You need to write that story down. Read it to yourself over and over and over again. Put a couple of slides and pictures together. Get up in front of a mirror and preach it to yourself first. Get ready. Get yourself a nice suit and a tie. Hit the roll and share that knowledge with other people. Nestor, man, I really feel you on the, you know, the being the introvert thing that you, you've mentioned several times and, I know that one of those widely known statistics out there is that, uh, you know, on the list of things that people fear, you know, like number one is death and number two is public speaking. And, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) I I totally understand that, uh, you know, before I get up and speak publicly, you just get this, you know, horrible feeling of nervousness, (laughs) you know, that you're just going to get up there and just blow it and look like a complete fool. And I'm just curious, you know, know, number one, do you still get nervous? And number two, how do you get over that? Yes, yes, yes. My hands get clammy. I am nervous. I'm like, I get thirsty. My wife has joined me in some of the conferences and she says, how you get over this? It's the moment you stand up there. She goes, I don't even know who you are. She goes, you stand up there, and I'm watching you, and I'm listening to you, and I'm like, who is that man? So it comes with the passion. But, yes, I get nervous. I'm going through my notes, and I could talk about the same topic over and over again, but I find myself at times questioning You know, should I add something? Is this the right audience, the right crowd? And I've learned to just just get up there. You know, it's like a preacher. A preacher gets up there, brings the sermon on Sunday. You have 110, 115 people. Your goal is to try to reach them all. But if only one person, you know, will will, um, receive the message, you're going to go home feeling pretty good about yourself. And that's what I do. I just... Don't think about it when you're hearing your name. Get up, run up there. Don't even read my bio. Let's start having a conversation. And I get over it really quick. Yeah, Nestor, I have to jump in there too. As Mike said, and I kid with Justin all the time, he picked 
the least eloquent guy in the sterile processing industry to start this podcast with him. <laughs> but uh, it's uh, exactly what you say is if your name is called and that's your time to tell a story. And I think to your earlier point, what's so important about this is everyone has a story to tell. And in particular, right. it's so important because so few of us are speaking that story. We're so focused you know, for good reason, on the technical side of the job, are we following the regulatory standards? Are we meeting all the quality standards? But even apart from that, the people in your department doing those jobs, they are people and they have passion or if they don't have passion, they should have passion. And how do you get that out of your people? And so, you know, to what you said about writing your story down and reading it to yourself, I guess the question I wanted to ask then as a leader, you know, specifically speaking to sterile processing managers, maybe, how would you speak to managers who who know they have people in, in their department who have a story to tell? They know their role as leaders is to create and cultivate confidence on the part of those frontline technicians. How do you get someone off the ground mm-hmm. and into the spotlight to give that first speech or that first in-service and to start down this path telling their own story? A tactic that I use when I started a new facility, I want to get to know my people. If you're going to manage, you have to know your people, who they are. So what I do, I start an interview one at a time. I share with them my passion. And what I do, I take the large post-it notes and I cover my walls in my office. And I put the employee's name up and I start having a conversation I want to understand what that individual's passion is. So I start by, okay, the different areas, decontamination, prep and pack, sterilization, case picking, et cetera, et cetera. Tell me out of all of those areas, which is the area that you love the most is this. Do you love teaching? So by the time I'm done, my walls are covered with their story, with their history, with their likes and dislikes, with their desires, with what they want to change, with their challenges. And then I step back, I close the door of my office, and I don't go into that office until probably weeks later because now I go to decon and I spend an entire week in decon with the employees. I go to prep and pack. I go through all the different areas, understanding what's going on, and then I have a full picture of who has that passion and who doesn't. Now, I want to work with those that, don't have the passion and try to understand what can I do to bring up the bar. So going back to certification, let's get you certified, you know, because when we get you certified we'll take a picture of you, we'll take your certification, put it up on the wall. We'll, we'll just celebrate you and who you are. We change the colors in our walls. You go to sterile processing departments across the United States. We're in the basement to begin with, but our walls are white. You know, you come to my sterile processing department, my walls are yellow, they're blue, they're green, they're orange. We pop colors in our walls. You'd be surprised how it changes the atmosphere. And those that have been hiding, those introvert uh, individuals like myself that have been hiding, they pop up. I want to help you educate. I want to help you do orientation and so on and so on. And that you first have to get involved to learn and understand where they're coming from, who they are, before you can empower them to become who you think they're going to be. And that's what I've done for the last 37 years, and it's been very successful. It's funny, Nestor, because I know we're talking about finding your voice, but I because you just told that story, I remember one and hopefully you'll remember it, that you told me one day about taking over for a manager at a hospital as the new manager and how you had a folder, a file on each of the staff members and they had performance issues in there. Some of them were considered to be great. And I remember you telling me that you brought everybody into the department. Well, go ahead. Tell the story. Yeah. Had I gone based on past history, I should have fired everybody. Should have fired everybody. Folders were, I mean, some employees, 
you needed a file cabinet just for their folders. But my mentality was, this is your record. This is your past history. Your past history is going to go in the past. We're going to shred it. So I am going to, I didn't tell them this, but that was, that's what I was doing. I'm going to empower you to believe that you're no longer who you were before. I am here to help you achieve and be empowered to believe that there is passion, that you do have a why. Come on, let's, let's bring that why out. So we started from scratch. We started their records from scratch. Do you know, Justin, that I still am in contact with almost all of those individuals? And at least, let me see, one, two, three, four of them right now, this is in New Jersey, are in supervisor's position at different hospitals throughout New Jersey. And when I got there, they were tech ones. Amazing. It was all by just giving them an opportunity. I am not here to follow past history. I remember telling them, I can't judge you for what I don't know. If I read those files, I'm going to have a pretty good idea of what happened here, but I wasn't here. So let's get rid of it. Let's start from scratch. It's like going to school and the teacher tells you, we're going to start you with an A. We'll see how you're going to finish, right? And that's incredible, Nestor, because you, you got to, I mean, I'm personally just sitting here thinking about all of those people as they spread out and influence all of their own, you know, the technicians that are working underneath them and how that story begins to just kind of mm -hmm. spread and, and they develop their own story. You know, I'm curious, you know, if you could give, you know, anybody advice as to how to start to be able to tell their story, kind of, you know, dip their foot into that public speaking and, and telling their story, what, what advice would you give them on how to get started? I think the first thing that you should do is get involved with other chapters. It's nice to sit at home and it's nice to, you know, get your CEUs, you know, at home, but get involved, show yourself. So what I did was I started getting involved. Someone injected in me that passion and told me, you can do this, Nestor. I started getting involved. I made business cards. I started going around and just basically started networking, letting people know that I'm available if you need. Basically, what I, what I did at the beginning was I selected a topic, a topic, and I remember that very first topic, the passion that empowers. I'm, I'm a drum facilitator, so I utilized my drumming skills, and I, I remember that entire presentation, but I, I picked a topic that I can relate to and someone gave me the opportunity. Someone did and believed, you know what, can you come? I, I kind of sold it over the phone and it was great. It sounded good. And since that day, it's been three years and it hasn't stopped. And it's been very, very successful. Thanks for, you know, folks like yourself, you know, Hank, Mike, and you, Justin, that are giving me this opportunity to do this with you guys today. So thank you again for doing this. All right. Well, they don't call you the closer for no good reason. I'm going to lob a softball <laughs> for the final question of segment two. We've got like five minutes, so I think we have plenty of time to tell the story. But what okay. is your most memorable moment from speaking? Wow. Just recently, this past weekend, I was at Christiana Hospital seminar uh, speaking about the whys of our lives. And, and one of the slides talks about the why is born out of pain. Now, what was different about this day, this presentation, is that my daughter, 36 years old, was in the audience. You know, uh, my daughter lives in Fort Myers, Florida. She's going through some health issues. She's been here since September getting the medical treatment that she needs, and she's, she's doing okay. Uh, long journey ahead. But, you know, she's like, Dad, what are you doing this week? And, oh, I have to go. Oh, can I come with you? And I'm like, ah, you sure? Yeah, I'll come with you. So I'm not way there. I'm like, hon, you know, I'm talking about this subject, and I always talk about you. So, you know, you give me the okay to talk about you. She goes, yeah, it's okay. I'm not going to sue you. Go right ahead. So I, I remember when I got to this slide, it was, it was painful for me because she was there. And her story is just 
incredible. You know, in 2007, she gave birth to a beautiful baby girl, Nyla, and Nyla dies three days later. Uh, in 2012, she gives stillborn birth to a baby boy named Charlie. Uh, from 2012, puncture bladder during a routine hysterectomy, 2013, bowel perforation, exploratory lab, colostomy. It was crazy to think that this child in the last several years have gone through so much. But it was one day where we were returning from Temple University, and we were sitting at home, and it was 4 o'clock in the morning, and she had no strength. And she looked at me, and she goes, you know what, Pops? I understand my purpose. Now, keep in mind, guys, she had no knowledge of my presentations that I've done before, but it's what she said. And she goes, Dad, I understand my purpose. I understand the why of my life. And it's my pain is showing me that my why is that I can't give up, that my why is that I have to help others. I am like that jigsaw puzzle. I'm just another piece of a puzzle, but I know that I am the missing piece of the puzzle, the most important piece of the puzzle. I know my why, Dad. If I got to go through what I have to go through to help others, then I am going to help others. So that day for me, it was amazing because when I got into that fly, without saying her name, just saying a little bit of her story, and then I told the audience, ladies and gentlemen, this lady that I'm talking to you about, and I flipped to the next slide, and it's pictures of her. It's my daughter, and she's standing, she's sitting right here. She was crying. You know what, what happened that moment? Everyone got up and gave her a standing ovation. People in the audience were crying, and I'm like, who comes to an Isham chapter conference and walks out of there, you know, with an experience like that? So I am grateful because I'm, I think that I found my why. And my why is to inject passion, to empower people, to let people know that you are important in what you do and that you do make a difference every day you walk into that sterile processing department. And that's what we do every day, making a difference. Thank you. Incredible, Nestor. Incredible. I know everybody gave your daughter a whole bunch of hugs too. Oh, it's, yeah. All those people coming out on a Saturday, they don't get there because they don't care. They get there because of what you just right. said. They want to make a difference. And that compassion right. is uh, just a, I can only imagine being in your shoes and in your daughter's shoes that day. It's, it's really a phenomenal story. And I'm really happy that you got to have that experience. Yeah, me too. I don't think it'll happen again, but I'm glad that it happened that day. I really, I really am. All right. Nestor, the closer Hernandez, everybody. Nestor, thanks for coming on the show. <laughs> Thank you, Hank, Mike, and Justin for the opportunity. Thank you so much. That was Nestor Hernandez, sterile processing department manager at Lehigh Valley Health Network. And guys, I'll let you do the talking. I've seen Nestor for several years and I've known him because he lives generally in my area and I see him at all of these Isham regional annual chapter seminars. He even brought, I'll tell you this too, he even brought his drums one time and at the very end of the show, uh, performed on the drums before they wrapped up. So, you know, we talked about color in the department, but I can tell you he brings just color to a lot of his life. And he was a, just a very inspirational guest, probably our first human interest guest that we've had on Beyond Clean. That's right, Justin. I mean, we talked all night about the why. I walk away saying, wow, wow, what a story, what passion, what opportunity, to share that, obviously, with his own folks in his department every day, but now on this platform with sterile processing professionals uh, across the globe. And this is the kind of encouragement and inspiration, like you said, that we are all about on this show. The reason that we created the podcast, not just to share information, but also to tap into that inspiration. We need more folks like Nestor Hernandez, and hopefully – this show will help some other folks find their voice and have the courage to step up and start sharing that story. Yeah, guys. I mean, I don't know how many times we've talked about how one of the biggest challenges to our industry 
is the fact that we are out of sight and out of mind and no one really knows the stories of our departments. And so finding a guy like Nestor and hopefully inspiring more people to step forward, step out of the shadows and tell those stories, I think is a really critical part to moving our industry forward. Yeah, Mike, that's so true. And I have a feeling that Nestor is going to be getting some calls for other speaking engagements after this episode gets out there. He's mostly just spoken regionally and speaking of using his story to inspire others to want to do this. I'll just put the call out right now. If all of you listening have somebody like Nestor who typically only speaks regionally and you've seen them speak at your seminars and you think that they deserve a larger platform and maybe come on to Beyond Clean and inspire others beyond just their region, all you got to do is send us an email to info at beyondclean.net. We definitely want to talk to others in the industry that have done a nice job of inspiring people. I love the story about him shredding the employee files when he took over the department. A clean start. That's a very refreshing perspective and looking for more stories like that as we continue to do Beyond Clean episodes. We're now going to get down the second slope, I guess, of 26 more episodes to close out the year in Beyond Clean. So I'm really excited about that. I know we had a chance to talk about it in the intro, but 26 episodes in the books, really been a great six months, and I've enjoyed working with the two of you very much, and so looking forward to another great six months and an annual anniversary show that I'm sure we'll have planned uh, excellent guests, maybe even revisit some of the people, so stay tuned for that. And that's going to do it for this week's show. As a reminder, you can help support us by subscribing to Beyond Clean on iTunes and Stitcher. We'd certainly appreciate a rating and a review because your feedback is important to the show. And if you do have any topics that you'd like us to cover on a future episode or if you'd like to share a picture anonymously on our Instagram page, just send us an email to info at beyondclean.net. On behalf of Hank, Mike, and myself, thank you for listening to another edition of Beyond Clean.